Hi everyone, uh, my name is Celso Viana and this is my contribution to the third Geometric Analysis Festival. Uh, the title of this mini course will be Volume Preserving Stability and Isoperimetry in Real Project Spaces. So first of all, I would like to thank Ho Ju Lee for organizing this very nice digital event and also for the opportunity to talk here. So the main theme for this mini course will be classifying uh, constant mean curvature hypersurfaces in terms of their in, uh, index of stability. And our main goal is to use that classification as an approach to the classical isoperimetric problem in, in very interesting spaces. So the plan for this, for this mini course is as follows. So in lecture one, which is this video here, I will introduce this question of isoperimetry and also this definition of volume preserving stability and discuss some previous results uh, related to this problem. So in lecture two, I will focus on three manifolds where we have special features to explore uh, when studying this classification problem. The emphasis will be on uh, space forms of positive curvature, uh, in particular the real projective space of dimension 3. And finally, in the third video, I will focus on the key ideas that we used in the proof of a recent classification result for these objects in the real projective space of any dimensions. Okay, so let me start by introducing this uh, problem of minimizing a perimeter in a class of regions of a given volume. So essentially what we want to do is to classify the regions that uh, have this minimization uh, characterization. So essentially the manifolds we're going to consider here are closed mainly, but you can also consider non-compact manifolds, but uh, in this case you need to impose for example the assumption that when you push into your manifold by the isometry group, then you get a, a compact set. The, the main reason we do that is just to make sure that we have existence for this uh, isoperimetric problem. Okay. So let me precise a little bit more and, uh, and also introduce the main characters in our discussion. So here I'm going to work uh, with sets of finite perimeter, but I'm using here a light notation for surface area and, and volume. So hopefully that won't cause you much, uh, too much confusion. So essentially, we want to minimize among all regions of omega prime with a, a fixed volume. I want to minimize the surface area, right? And if I have a minimizer for this problem, this, this region will be called an isoperimetric region. And the boundary will be called an isoperimetric hypersurfaces. So if you solve this problem for all volumes, then you can construct uh, the so-called isoperimetric profile. So it's just a function that associates to each volume the area of the corresponding uh, isoperimetric hypersurface. So essentially what, what you want to do is to describe this function, show how it looks like, and or, or, or for example trying to prove some comparison theorems for that function. Okay. So let me start with the most important case, the case that motivated this isoperimetric uh, business, uh, which is the case of the Euclidean space. So we know that the solutions for this problem there are the geodesic balls, right? And uh, this is a very famous result. In fact, we have many proofs of this characterization, but I, I guess the most um, known and most famous proof is the one that uses symmetrization techniques, right? And, uh, and this characterization result of geodesic balls can be seen through this beautiful isoperimetric inequality that appears here, right? So the rigorous proof of this result was given by Schmidt 
in 1940, and uh, and the proof um, can also be generalized uh, to the round sphere in the hyperbolic space. Okay, so the key feature about these simply connected space forms is that they have reflections with respect to any direction. So this is a universal property that's very important for as far as symmetization technique is concerned. Okay, so if you move to other Riemannian spaces, then of course the symmetization technique uh, will not be available, right? And so you need to come up uh, with different methods to approach the isoperimetric uh, problem. Okay, so, so in that sense, we divide the problem for general Riemannian manifolds in two parts. So the first part concerns the existence of isoperimetric regions and also the regularity of these objects, right? So this is, of course, a non-trivial problem. For example, if your manifold is non-compact, then minimizers can drift off to infinity, right? And then there is the second part, which concerns the topology and also the geometry of these minimizers, right? So in this mini course, uh, I will focus only on the second part because essentially we already have a very successful result tackling the first question, the question of existence and irregularity. So here, here is the theorem. But essentially, it says that under the assumption we made on our manifold, then you always have a solution. You always have an isoperimetric region. And moreover, this isoperimetric region is as smooth except for a closed set of Hausdorff dimension at most n minus 7. So if your manifold has dimension 7 or less, then these objects are always smooth. And, uh, but even in higher dimension, the singular set is, is small in, in this sense. So this was a very important contribution and people started working uh, using this regularity result and some progress started to be made in other spaces, such as the one I'm, I'm showing here. So as you can see, most of these spaces has a product structure and so they still have a lot of reflection symmetries that you can use. And so building on that regularity theorem showed earlier, then you can, for example, show that isoperimetric region in these spaces are rotationally symmetric, for example, right? So uh, I'm just putting some examples here. There is also the counterpart in higher dimensions, but a very explicit, explicit description of the minimizers is only in dimension. And three, okay, and so after these examples, I would like to include also um, the quotient of R three by a cyclic group. This is a result of Rito Ray and Ross, and and also the result in the real projective space R P three that we will get back to uh, later on, okay. Continuing dimension 3, I'd like to mention uh, this other important contribution that concerns um, flat tori times r. Essentially, the problem is not completely solved in this class of manifolds, but it, it is almost completely solved. So let me precise a little bit more what I'm talking about here. So essentially, if you look at the moduli space of flat tori, the moduli space will be given by the strip that appears in this picture, the part of the strip that is above the circle of radius one, right? So any lattice that gives you the flat tori has a vector which is in the x direction, a unit vector in that direction, and the other vector uh, has it, 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 its extremal point at this region. Okay, and so uh, what we know about this problem in this class of manifold is that there is some number beta zero which is very explicit, such that if you are above that uh, threshold, then the solutions of the isoperimetric problems are uh, classified. Okay, 
but then there is this compact region uh, compact region where the problem is still open right so but still uh, essentially the problem is almost completely solved okay so um, so other previous results that I would like to mention is a result of Johnson and Morgan and also Narduli that concerns uh, small isoperimetric regions in Riemannian manifold. So essentially they proved that these objects are nearly round, nearly round in a way that you can precise. And moreover, there is also a description of where this small isoperimetric region is located on your Riemannian manifold and that is connected to critical points of the scalar curvature on your manifold. Okay, So these are results for small volume. We also have results for large uh, isoperimetric regions and, and, and for this part we, we work on asymptotically flat Riemannian tree manifolds, which are manifolds of great interest in general relativity. So many people work on this problem, so I'm including some of them here, but the list is not exhaustive, so I apologize for missing some other important contributions there. But essentially, for this class of Riemannian manifolds, you have a canonical foliation at infinity, by surfaces of constant mean curvature, okay? And it turns out that this work shows, this work showed that um, each leaf of this canonical foliation is uniquely isoperimetric for the volume they encloses, they enclose, right? Uh, so here I'm assuming the volume is very large. So this is a very interesting result because in R3, geodesic balls are not uniquely minimizers, uh, are not unique, right? Because you can translate those uh, geodesic balls. But as soon as the ADMS of your ambient space, of your Riemannian manifold is positive, then you can pro prove uh, stronger properties, such as uh, this uniqueness property I mentioned. And of course, that is only true under certain curvature assumption on, on the manifold. Okay, so these were some previous results on the isoperimetric problem. So now let's focus on uh, variational formulas for critical points. So I would like to review some basic equations that we have for critical points for this problem. Okay, so I'll be a little bit more general in this part and we will assume that our hypersurface is only two-sided. So in, in that sense, I'm including, for example, immersed hypersurfaces. So the key point is that I have a unit normal vector field defined globally on the surface sigma, which allows us to talk about the inside and the outside with respect to that uh, hypersurface. Mm -hmm. And so, if you want to study the equation for this critical point, what you want to do is to look at variation of your, of your hypersurface. And one way to do a variation is by looking at uh, the flow associated to some vector field x. Or, or in other words, you can just use uh, a perturbation of your surface in the normal direction uh, um, and that we have defined on the surface, okay? And so here we have the area functional, which measures the area of the perturbed surface, sigma t, and also we have this volume, v of t, which is a sign volume in the sense that it can be positive and negative. So essentially, it measures the volume that is between the surface sigma and the surface sigma t, as showed in this, in this picture. So if this function is identically zero, then we call this variation volume preserving. And, and, and that's the class of variation will be uh, restricted to in the sequence, okay? Okay, so if you have a critical point, then of course the derivative is zero. And this derivative can be computed. It's a well-known computation 
then what you get is just the integral of the mean curvature times this function f and this function f is just the normal component of the variational vector field x uh, that you used to perturb your surface so this is the normal component so it turns out that for variation that is volume preserving uh, the the integral of this function f is identically zero and, and in fact you have the converse statement for any function with average zero over the surface you can always construct a variation that is volume preserving having that function as the normal component okay so we will be concerning with function with that property so as a result a critical point must uh, has constant mean curvature h okay Right, so a uh, an isoperimetric surface is more than a critical point, right? It's a global minimizer, so in particular it minimizes area up to second order for, for variations that preserves the enclosed volume, right? So the second variational formula for area gives you a formula for this second derivative and, and, and what you get is just a quadratic form right which we call it the index form of uh, of, of sigma and, and uh, it's a symmetric index symmetric quadratic form and associated to it we have this uh, linear jacobi operator which is given here so so some quantities that appears in the formula uh, so we have the rich curvature of your ambient space in the direction of the unit normal vector and also the norm of the second fundamental form square okay so essentially uh, what we want to do is to look at surfaces that minimizes area up to second order for volume preserving variation and remember that this implies the integral of this function f being zero right and we use that as our definition of volume preserving stability so essentially, if you have a two-sided immersed constant mean curvature surface, then it is stable if the quadratic form uh, up, uh, above is always non-negative for functions that have average zero over the surface. We will refer to these functions later in, the, in, the, in this discussion as test functions, okay? and the inequality above as the stability inequality. So the goal will be to classify, to see in which situations we can classify surfaces having this property, okay? So we will see that um, finding good test functions that you can use in the stability inequality, inequality will depend on the geometric nature of the ambient uh, space. Okay, so this definition was introduced by Barbosa du Carmo and later with Eschenberg in the class of Riemannian manifolds, and they gave a very beautiful characterization of geodesic spheres as the only volume preserving stable hypersurfaces. So, one remark I'd like to make here is that. Um, so in this definition, we are including immersed hypersurfaces, right? And around the time they proved this result, there were important examples, constructed examples of immersed constant mean curvature uh, surfaces in the Euclidean space. And, uh, and so this result is showing that those immersed constant mean curvature hypersurfaces uh, were not, are not stable for the isoperimetric okay so uh, I'd like to take some minutes just to discuss very briefly uh, a key idea uh, that you need the key idea improving a result like this so um, it turns out that that by now we know that the key ingredient in the proof of this result is the existence of conformal vector fields in these spaces so a conformal vector field is just a vector field that satisfies this equation here. So its derivative in the direction of some other vector field is just a multiple 
of that vector field uh, through some uh, function here, this phi, phi of x. Okay, so this is a good equation, it, and this equation is relevant to our problem because if you compute the divergence of the tangential part of this vector field uh, over some surface sigma, then what you get is a, a function that depends on, on the geometry of your surface, like the mean curvature here, and also on this uh, potential function phi that comes from the conformal um, equation for x. Okay, so if you apply the divergence theorem to this equation, what you get is the so-called Minkowski formula. And this Minkowski formula is relevant to our problem because it gives you for free a very nice test function that you can use in the stability inequality, right? And so you need to do some computations to check that this is indeed a good, a good function, okay? So, for example, in the Euclidean space, this vector field, this conformal vector field here is very simple. It's just the position vector field that we are uh, familiar with, okay? And the function phi of x is just the constant function equal to 1. And in the sphere, you also have a very simple description for these conformal vector fields. They are, for example, the tangential part of coordinate vectors in the Euclidean space. Okay. And, right, so this is how the proof goes in, the, in these spaces, and you might ask, like, what is the geometric interpretation for this Minkowski test function? So what kind of variations you are making on, on, on your surface that gives you this uh, particular test function, right? So it turns out that we have a very beautiful description for this Minkowski test function. Uh, and that was proved by Wente in 91, 91, a few years after the previous result. And so, essentially, this uh, variation is very simple to describe. And uh, we, in fact, we have a picture here that will help us understand. So, essentially, what you do is you start with your surface sigma, and then you take the equidistant flow associated to it, then that gives you this surface sigma r, right? And so you are increasing volume, right? In the enclosed volume. And so if you scale down your hypersurface in a way that you keep the enclosed volume the same, then you get this blue curve that appears here. And that, that blue curve is the volume preserving variation uh, that I'm, uh, I was talking about, okay? So what Wente proved is that this type of volume preserving variation always decreases area up to second order, except when you are in a round sphere, okay? And if you compute the velocity associated to, to this uh, perturbation or the normal component of this perturbation, what you get is just the Minkowski test function that we saw earlier. So this is a very beautiful description in, in, in the Euclidean uh, space. Okay. Okay. So after this result of Barbosa, du Carmo in Eschenberg in '88, uh, the next classification result for stable CMC surface was given by Rito, Ray, and Ross in '92. But then he had to work in dimension three. Right, and um, and it's important to highlight here that in this space you don't have those conformal vector fields that you can use, right? So and so in this case you need to argue differently, and in fact they had to work in dimension three where you have more structure to to use that in a way replaces the conformal um, vector field argument that we saw earlier. So essentially, they prove that in this space, you have geodesic spheres and tubes about geodesic as stable constant mean curvature surfaces. So uh, since your manifold is non-simply connected, then you should expect to see 
surfaces other than spheres uh, as stable, right? Such as the tubes about geodesics. And tubes about geodesics, they, they are not stable when the radius is very small, but as soon as the radius increases, then they become stable. And in fact, they are optimal candidates for the, for the isoperimetric problem. Okay, right, and um, a final remark I'd like to make is that this was the first uh, situation where classifying the volume preserving stable surfaces uh, gave an, uh, as an application the solution for the isoperimetric problem. So our result is a generalization of this result of Vitore and Ross to the real project to the space of any dimension. And so this is our main result, which appears here. And as you can see, the possibilities are that you have a geodesic spheres, and then you also have these um, other examples called the Clifford hypersurfaces, which are given by the product of spheres. So they live in the round spheres, in the round sphere, but they are invariant by the antipodal map. And so when you take the quotient by the antipodal map, you get a very nice embedded hypersurface in the real projective space. And they are the generalization of, of, of a tubular neighborhood of geodesics in dimension 3. Okay? And since we are also considering immersed CMC surfaces, hypersurfaces, then there is also the possibility that you have a two-fold covering of RPN and this is also a two-sided stable example okay so in the in the in the next videos i will discuss uh, some key features that you can explore in dimension three uh, to study the isoperimetric problem there and also the key ingredients and the key ideas that we use in the proof of this theorem in any dimension so see you there. Thank you.